for a complete novice, could you describe what Lloyd's is? If you imagine Glastonbury. If you could do it in Lloyd's, you could probably do it anywhere. anywhere. It's nothing quite as sweet as getting the deal done. So how would your friends describe you? You'll do you go. want to answer that? <laughs> <laughs> Somebody else answer this um, question. The, the day before you retire is probably that's the time you stop learning. There is a misconception of everyone wants to do things digitally. And it's the same with the underwriters. They want to build a rapport with the brokers who are bringing them the business. They had their ships hijacked by pirates. And it, and it, and it isn't Johnny Depp and Pirates of the Caribbean. It is very scary. I w wanted to just ask around some of the projects working with the UN. It wasn't a question of if, it was a question of when. The modelling looked around 14 million people could starve. Your favourite risk ever? This is the maritime equivalent to Live Aid. Yeah. You don't want to be the only band that didn't play. Being part of something that is doing the right thing for so many people. Perhaps historically Lloyd's and the city was kind of seen as slightly an uncaring money-making machine. What skills would you be looking for when you're growing a team? I would say that Hi everyone, today we're talking to Darren Norris and Jill Martin. They both work um, within the logistics and marine division of Howden Specialty and have been um, in, working within the industry for nearly 40 years, I think, both of you for nearly 40 years. Um, today we'll be talking through their career in, in insurance, specifically some of the projects that have had a global impact and um, helped support the lives of others as well. So thank you very much, both of you, for joining me. You're Great. So I think if we just, as a little bit of an introduction, talk about pre anything to do with insurance, when you were at school, where are you both from and, and what was your favourite subject at school? So if I go to you first, Jill. Well, I moved around a little bit as, uh, as a child. So I went to about five or six schools because my mother spent some time as an estate agent, which meant we moved a lot. So perpetually being the new girl, um, so I went to lots of different schools, but predominantly in Kent. Um, I think favourite subjects are usually connected to favourite teachers. Um, so for me, I had a brilliant uh, German teacher. She was excellent, really inspiring in my sort of secondary school years. And in sixth form, we had a doctor of English teaching us. So... Um, yeah, she was really formidable and, and, and interesting and inspiring. So those two stand out. Um, I didn't do as well at school as I probably should have done. I was a bit more interested in what was going on at the boys' school. Um, so that's, yeah, that's something that led me to come to this industry rather than university. So I decided to go to university because I wasn't that engaged in studying. Mm. But my two favourite teachers meant that those were the two favourite subjects. I think that's that's fair. I think it's usually the the person teaching you. Yeah. Is that the same same with you, Darren? What's your? Yeah. Well, I, well, I was I was brought up in South East London, so on the borders of Kent, so similar sort of uh, area to, to Jill. Um, mine was anything to do with sport, really. The whole sitting in a classroom writing in a book was not was not my bag, and and. Interesting that then played out in later life in, in in this job to be honest, but no, it was it was anything to do with sport was 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 my bag rather than yeah. anything educational. <laughs> we have we've had quite a few people say that they weren't super education sort of academic people yeah. before coming into this industry, which is interesting because you might not think that from the outside that you have to come from a super academic background really. I mean. It would, I don't think a lot of not a lot of people in, in, in our industry have come into our industry because that's what they wanted to do. I mean, mm. I don't remember too many 14-year-olds being desperate to go into insurance because <laughs> um, it's dull and boring. <laughs> um, but so, so you know, I, I, yeah, it's an interesting point because looking back, yeah, there, there's, there's definitely, I mean, some of those very educated people are here, but yeah, you're right. It was, it was, a, it was an industry where you kind of come into it and... and you got taught the job when you got here, mm. rather than knowing much about it before you before you got me. I didn't. Did you? Did uh, you before you got I, I sort of think that we're looking in retrospect, and I think that going forward, the education and academic side is more important. I think for us, we spent most of our career so far talking and walking, right? Mm -hmm. You know, we're carrying paper and going to see people face to face, and you've got to have the mental agility to think on your feet and respond to argument and counter argument and negotiate in in kind of real time um 
and a lot of that's quite instinctive and character traits it's not taught True. Whereas I think now there is a really nice hybrid with the emerging lines of insurance which are technology driven and data driven and therefore you need bright people that can understand the numbers and collate information and it becomes a nice marriage of the instinctive negotiation um, and argument and counter argument supported by proper data and analytics. Um, so I think the 30 odd years we've been doing it won't be the same as the mm. next 30 years and risks have changed you know the area we work in you know you could simplify it and say it's the pointy end and the blunt end of a ship and the stuff that goes in it but actually the type of ships and the type of cargoes and the trading environments have become much more complex and sophisticated and that means there are opportunities for really bright young things to come and make this a, a more interesting dynamic space that is data led yeah um, and 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 academia and intelligence will all be contributions to that but still you know deals still need to be done by people you know and I think servicing is less necessary to do a lot of the face-to-face -face stuff but the real deals are still done in person in real time I yeah sounds like that's kind of where you came into it when you first started is it all being all about the people rather than what qualifications that you had and what things you'd done at school um and is that is that kind of part of your person how would your friends describe you what's your kind of what is that part of your personality being a people person i think there's a definite work mode that isn't necessarily representative of you in your private life. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, if you ask my, my market friends and colleagues, I think they'd, they'd probably say I'm quite determined, um, forceful, um, you know, um, probably less prone to, to compromise. Um, but I think one of the things that spans both sides is that I care deeply about what I'm doing. I think, the, the sort of the fundamentals of, of our business rely uh, on on these very sort of slightly nostalgic phrases, but they're, they're really important now. So utmost good faith is a really important one, that when you say something that you know it's true or you've made your best endeavours to make sure it's true, and if you don't know the, the answer to a question, you say, I don't know, and, I, and I've got the integrity to go away and find out and come back. So I do think that... In my private life, I'm probably a bit, you know, warmer and fluffier. Um, but when I'm here, I'm paid to get the best deal for my client. Um, and that's what I will do. Mm. And, you know, that's that, that doesn't come with many compromises. Yeah. But still acting with integrity, which is something that comes up quite a lot about, like, being honest and but f acting with integrity on all fronts. Yeah, I think it's very important because it, it's not necessarily... Um, the, the content of the contract or the client that, that you're dealing with at that particular moment, but your behaviours mean that the the underwriters you're dealing with will want to deal with you again for the next client. And yeah. then the next client may be fantastic and recommend you to somebody else because you don't overpromise, you don't you know, you don't you don't fib, um, you know, you have fair disclosure. Um, and I think all of those things actually generate its own momentum and reputationally mm -hmm. um, you can spend 30 40 years building a reputation and, and lose it in one contract if you don't maintain your integrity yeah. so I think that's that's something that that's important and fostered here as well as yeah. individually I, yeah, the face-to-face -face -to -face trading is, is is a London Lloyd's insurance trait it's not done so much around the world um, you know, so, so so fairly early on, you, you you find yourself starting to understand body language and starting to, to to look at people's faces and whether they are actually paying attention and whether they're interested in what you're saying. So it's so, uh, you know, from that respect, a lot of that isn't skills taught. Yeah, it certainly weren't taught to me at, at school. But you, you kind of pick them up as you go along. Um, I mean, from a, from a character point of view. It's interesting that Jill just described a German teacher exactly the same way as you described yourself. <laughs> so maybe that teacher had a bit of influence. Um, one hopes. One hopes, yes, apart from the German. One aspires. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I, how do people describe it? I mean, I'm not 
known for being particularly patient um, in, in, in and around. But I mean, that, that's it's 30 something, whatever, 37 years of, of, of doing this now. And, you know, when, when we started, there wasn't any internet, you know, everything was done. Everything was traded face to face until the beginning with, with the bits of paper. You were putting bits of paper in front of people. You were then describing what the risk was about and, and how you did things. And none of that was, you couldn't Google it. You couldn't look it up. So, you know, it was very much done on, on what you could say and, and people had to believe in, in what you were telling them. And, and if they ever found out that they, what you said wasn't right, then you probably lost that underwriter as a, as, a, as a market forever. So that's that's very much driven in, in, in where we are. I said it was it was mm. well, for me it was pre-internet or someone described the other day pre suitcases having wheels. <laughs> um, back in the day, you used to have to carry a suitcase. But yeah. Um, so yeah, it, it, it's a, it's a face to face learning, and, and I think that we have an industry where people are literally learning all the time. And mm. you had a phrase recently where you where you were saying, you know, the, the, the day before you retire is probably that's the time you stop learning cause, because you, cause, cause you, you're done and out. But it's not with the changing world, with, with whether that's in, you know, in an insurance uh, industry or industries around the world or just the world itself, things move on really mm. quickly. You know, you, you've got to keep them, you've got to keep your, your, your mind open to learning as you're going through. Definitely. And that creates interesting opportunities because you end up with, with things that was very, I mean, marine and cargo that, that we're in was very traditional. It's the, the, the first insurance hundreds of years ago. And you look at what might be the insurance risk now with climate, that wasn't an issue then. Yeah. That would never have been a subject. So, you know, what do we know about it as opposed to someone who might be coming out of, of university or school right now that's got an interest in it or maybe even done a degree in it? They know a lot more than we do. So Reverse yeah. mentoring is definitely a yeah. thing. Yeah. Definitely a thing. Um, you know, you sort of get sort of decrepit old fossils like myself that can't work out. You know, what app you need for this and that. So there's that kind of footfall. But but also, I think people that have had a very uh, up to date understanding education on 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 certain technologies um, that and you know emerging emerging issues like climate um, are definitely feeding into mm. you know our generation. Learning from people coming new into it from a different perspective is is, is yeah. probably huge. Okay. But also, you described things being face to face a lot more. Mm -hmm. There's huge learnings for people coming into the industry now that won't be doing that because that reading body language, understanding how to talk to people, is something that's also an art that you have to practice. That you know you won't. We still do it with clients, and yeah. colleagues though. Uh, you know, one of my first bosses said to me, you know, treat treat your colleagues like clients um, and, and that sort of didn't resonate with me for a really really long time but actually you know there are difficult clients they do make unreasonable requests and they can interrupt you when you're in the middle of something else and you know they can have completely unrealistic expectations and I think you know all of those things happen in your career you know mm. you're going to work with somebody who you know has a different kind of um, set priorities to you and negotiating how you can get the best from each other whether it's a client an underwriter or a colleague i think those those skills they're, they're they're life skills not just insurance skills absolutely and i think yeah it sounds like you can you'll be nurturing those as well as having people come in that are understand new new things that are happening in the industry or come from a compl completely different skill sure. set yep. but you both mentioned kind of starting off Lloyd's uh, being there in person for a complete novice could you describe what Lloyd's is and how it and how the kind of London insurance market has changed potentially I'd say Lloyd's is a hugely misunderstood uh, thing so lots of people think it's a company and it's not so if you imagine Glastonbury, right, mm -hmm. it's just a location. You've got bands, you've got concessions, you've got people selling, you know, hot dogs and tie-dye t-shirts and all that stuff. It's a collection of people trading. Um, and that's what Lloyd's is. It's, in its simplest form, it's a building where people go and they sit down and they trade and then they leave. Now, it's slightly more complex than that because in order to have the privilege of trading in there, you have to meet certain criteria about your behaviours and you contribute to a central fund that, you know, if the wheels come off on your business, uh, but the, it's no fault of the clients, that there is a reserve to draw upon. Mm -hmm. So 
every valid claim gets paid. There's no question of insolvency or any of those horror stories that lots of people hear about banks collapsing and so on. So Lloyd's is, um, it's important, it, but it's a meeting place. Like a marketplace almost. So it's, it's a market. It's a market. Yeah. It's a market. It's we refer to it as the market. Yeah, yeah. so there's brokers and insurers, yeah. and is that it? Or are there other... Well, it's short, effectively, if you, if you did it as a market, so there are literally tables within that building where underwriters who are going to who are going to write the risk, bookmakers, if you want a, a different, mm. different spin on it, that they will actually sit at a table and you as a broker will go in with, with, with your with your account, with, with what you're trying to sell, um, and they will either agree to, to participate or not. So they'll buy it or not. Um, and it's, it's, there's a lot more complications within that, mm. but in, in a very simple term, yeah, it's, it's people sitting at tables or at desks in a building that, that, that the underwriters sit and the brokers effectively move around the market talking to different people and then you get depending on what risk you've got you've got different people who are better different underwriters who might write different risks um might, might be different classes as in of, of whether it be marine or aviation or property or energy natural resources climate whatever it might be but as as, as you're going around that market you also get to know people so it then becomes a bond with the fact that you will take a number of your risks your, your your insurance policies to certain people that you get on really well with so you get the face to face it's the it's the the you know what what is a presentation if someone's making a presentation if you're sitting with you and one underwriter presenting a risk that's a presentation yeah. if as we do in our world you end up at a conference in front of 300 people it's the same presentation it just feels very different and that and that that's a learn certainly for me as well to 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 get that you know 300 people staring at you while you're, while you're standing up is, is a very scary thing. But but effectively, it, it is a market. I mean, it, it's as simple yeah. as that. It's, it's that's, and that's yeah. how... What, does it still exist as an in-person format or has it, has it changed over the past, in, in, within your career time? I think that one of the first visible changes for, for me was the composition of who was providing the capacity and the money behind the syndicate. So um, so when I joined uh, an insurance syndicate in Lloyds, traditionally had hundreds, possibly thousands of private individuals, and they were called names, um, and they all pledged to, you know, putting a certain money, amount of money in the business, and then, if, you know, if the wheels came off, they would literally pledge to say, you can take the shirt off my back, you can take the home that I've worked for. It was unlimited liability for the individuals. So I think the, the greatest shift in the first part of my career was that individual names started to fall away and corporate capital came in. And with corporate capital, the amount of capacity, the amount of risk that you could buy in London increased enormously enormously um, so so that was the first shift and I'd say the most recent one which has been a real driver on the face-to-face -face element was probably COVID mm -hmm. so we we've had a very sort of intimate way of dealing with business we're this close we're you know handling papers and things together uh, but COVID stopped all of that in its tracks um, so the default into more electronic trading and presentations was necessary you know the wheels had to keep turning it's really interesting now that the various committees in Lloyd's get a lot of feedback and it's the youngest people saying we want face to trade yeah face to face trading and you would if, if, if you kind of dial into cliches you'd expect the young people go oh no this is all digital and it's all kind of super sexy you know clever platforms and, and and stuff to work on but actually they want the face to face um, and I think that's part of the whole experience of, you know, starting your clients, understanding their risk, going in and negotiating and getting the deal. Because it's not quite as sweet as getting the deal done and everyone's equally happy or equally unhappy, hopefully happy. And, um, you know, I think that's quite important. So I think, I don't, I don't think it'll ever be quite like it used to be, no. but it definitely won't disappear. Definitely won't disappear. Yeah. Well, what makes London unique from other insurance? I mean, if, if London was was is was the insurance hub of the world um, and, and is still held in, in very high regard wherever you go it, it certainly in in era pre-covid it was about if, if if you if you'd done your training in london and you 
you would handled the face to face stuff to then be on the end of a phone or the end of an email was easy. Yeah. So this was like this was the almost the the bull pit of training was if you could do it in Lloyd's, you could do probably it do it anywhere. Mm. Yeah. And I suppose for a lot of people that there is a misconception of, you know, everyone wants to do things digitally. But if part of what you're going into is dealing with clients, brokering deals, you do want to be also working on those skills of being able to work face to face and talk face to face. Not everyone does things perfectly over over you know zoom or whatever mm-hmm. it might be mm-hmm. and like you're saying if you can do it face to face then you can easily do it over the phone yep. but it's harder to recreate it the other way around yep. so it's so it's still really important to be able to have that place where people can meet face to face and to be honing those skills of I, I think it just speaks to feeling like you matter Mm. You know, when you, there's nothing worse than, uh, you know, phone up for your car insurance or the council tax or something else. And, it, and it's a it's a series of numbers to press to eventually speak to a human. Now, OK, for most of us in our private life, we're, we're spending relatively small amounts of money to insure our car and our house and all the rest of it. But as businesses that are spending potentially millions and millions and millions of dollars on insurance... Um, I don't think it's unreasonable to say I want to know who I'm dealing with, not just the company, but the individuals. And if something goes wrong, who am I calling? You know, um, and what's the name of my leading underwriter? Because that is um, a, sort of a, a, a tri-party relationship, the broker, the client and the underwriter. You know, you, you're all stakeholders in the outcome of that particular contract. Um, and and I think it is relative a little bit to the size of your company or the people you employ or the or, or the premium spend that that you have. But I think that's that's that is something that's important to the client base. They want to know who they're writing the check to, and and I think that's important. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I think more and more actually. People think that it's gone the other way, but that human touch is Mm -hmm. becoming more and more important within technology as well. Like it's that's not a replacement. There needs to be a kind of marrying of the two rather than it replacing. Uh, How many adverts you see on TV for companies, and they talk about the fact they're real people, and you and you get a person, which is what what you know. That's what is that what you said? You're looking at some seriously complex risks, and people want to phone up and say, "Okay, I want to ask you questions. I don't want to go down a chat box. I don't want to." frequently ask is my is my question in there i want to talk to someone who's going to come back to me and, and, and tell me what's going on yeah and it's the same with the underwriters they want to build a rapport with the brokers who are bringing them the business so they want to build a, a, a rapport where you come back and you know a, a 2d zoom image on a screen is is not the same as being able to look at people and read body language or understand them or, or have that it, what the zoom thing does do it takes away the chit chat yeah so whereas whereas i would walk into a meeting with a, with an underwriter you'd probably have five minutes of talking rubbish about the football or whatever whatever it be and then you had the meeting whereas zoom and teams meetings seem to be it starts at nine o'clock and you you kind of crack in mm. you lose the you lose that sort of uh, almost a personal touch yeah the, the, end, which is a bit the kind of fizzing in between exactly yeah yeah the, 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 the yeah talking rubbish and yeah. Teams people. yeah i think when you when you drill down you know why do people buy insurance and and i think really it falls into three ca- categories so you know the first one is contractually you have to so you've got a mortgage you've got to buy your house insurance um secondly you're legally obliged to you employ people fall over break legs all that sort of stuff you have to do have it but i think the third category is the, is for me one of the really interesting categories which is it's the fear factor and to go and see a client that you know perhaps has got ships and cargo and ports and terminals and thousands of staff and to ask the person what keeps you awake at night, that's that's what an insurance policy can do, is, is make those guys be able to sleep at night, that if anything goes horribly wrong, there is there is a way to get through it. Um, we had some clients in, in the uh, sort of late 90s, early 2000s, that were trading uh, around um, Somalia, and they had their ships hijacked by pirates, and it, and, it, and it isn't Johnny Depp and Pirates of the Caribbean, it is very scary it, it is you know absolutely terrifying and when you've got crew that perhaps have worked for your company you know for 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 decades or perhaps second generation and you know that you know there's wives and kids and families at home and they're under duress and threat of life that is a very emotional response because you care and, it, and quite often these shipping companies have their family name painted down the side of their ships it's personal mm. so all of those 
systems that can support that that event to get a good outcome and everybody's safe and and um, it's it's not a devastating financial event for the company. I think that's that's really interesting when you start probing the what keeps people away absolutely i think that it being more than a legal tick box and something that's really about people's lives people's livelihoods the yeah. future of the planet different industries uh, it, t- it covers all of that uh, our industry does anyway that's and right. that you know everything that every decision anyone's made has been insured usually yeah. in some way so yeah. um which is which is huge and people don't often really think about that um from it from that perspective um you, you've spoken a bit about ships and i think it'd be good to, from from both of your from your perspective what is the kind of marine logistics area of the business what kind of things do you work on how would you describe it to someone who has no idea what you might be doing they could probably have a guess but <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, so, so from, from lo- the logistics that we're involved with um, is all things aviation, all things marine, hull, ships, um, and all things cargo. So, uh, you know, literally anything in a cardboard box, pretty much everything Amazon does. But, but anything that, that anybody moves around the world, that's insured. So we would be involved in the, in the, the goods on the ship. We might be insuring the ship itself, or we might have cargo on an aeroplane. We might have passenger flights. But, it, it, yeah, I mean, it's logistics, anything that moves, effectively, it, it is ours. And then it, then that leads into, the, that's got, got, got tendrils into to other industries within insurance. But, yeah, I mean, it, in, in, a, in a fairly broad gap, it's anything marine, anything that's in transit, and anything that, mm-hmm. that, that flies in the sky, or whether it be airports, um, you know, baggage handlers, anything to do with, with that, uh, what you said a, a minute ago. It's insurance is behind so much that people don't know about whether that's a footballer getting injured or you know a, a, an aircraft falling out of the sky or you know every travel insurance policy you buy in case you're ill when you're in Spain or you know to your point with that with that last comment that the kidnap and ransom insurance on the on the on the crew or the the recovery of the, the, the of the vessel itself these things are all all insured these are all designed to to make us not worry about that we're going on holiday to where we're going to go, yeah. and if we get ill, we're going to get with thousands of pounds worth of bill, or are we going to get safe? Are we going to get brought back home? All of that's in, in our world, effectively. Yeah, um, and I think it, on the point of things that you don't realise. I remember, I think yesterday you were saying about how you think of something like um, something minor, like Lewis Capaldi's tour being cancelled. Mm, yeah. Like that's an, a huge insurance piece yeah. that you just wouldn't think about the impact that, that would have without that insurance. Yeah. You know. Yeah, so, you know, I think that for, for anybody watching this this podcast, I think if you if you have any personal interest at all, anything from reading a book to sport to music to architecture, there is insurance supporting those interests, um, either on an industrial scale or, or on a quite small scale. Um, and something like the Lewis Capaldi um story i think is 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 very recent and very relevant because it it speaks into obviously the mental health issues which has promoted conversation regarding the language of insurance policies so normally um the reason for an artist um cancelling an event would you know be injury or political unrest or some, some other reason so mental health as a defined peril has been the subject of dialogue for a while but I think that one in particular um, you know has generated our industry press response to that because you know quite rightly he's prioritizing his his health and you know that is it's promoted a cancellation of various events but tickets are sold venues are booked merchandise is made distribution of um, you know public relations and, and advertising materials take place and that that all supports the the financial investment of various record labels and promoters in that artist um, so you know we don't want to be in a situation where if there's a financial hit on those supporting industries that that then stops the investment in new talent coming mm. through because they just can't afford to run the risk so yeah there's there's a there's a huge knock on I think it's um you know it's in the ether it may not be recognized but it's on 
everything yeah i think it's interesting you say about how things like that then spark conversations within the industry about wording changes but also just attitudes towards certain risks and yep. emerging risks and i think over the last over your career time, but especially the last 10 years, I know that you mentioned COVID having an impact on the way that we do business, mm -hmm. if you like, but is there anything that's that's changed within the industry itself, any emerging trends over the past 10 years that are notable to you that, you can, that you've can you noticed? I mean, well, I, I would say that, you know, while, while the insurance industry was, was, was started many hundreds of years ago, it probably only sort of lumbered towards the 20th century a few years back um you know we, we were still walking to lawyers with bits of paper and folders and getting people to sign them so electronic trading is starting to to started to come in were the brokers accepting it kind of sometimes you know but but covid changed all of that because mm -hmm. we didn't have the ability to walk into lawyers and get someone to sign a bit of paper so you had to find a, 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 a what was a truly legal binding way of, of transacting business and if they hadn't started the electronic trading X amount of years before that, I'm not sure where we would have been. To be honest, it would, would have been would have been potentially chaotic. But um, so so I mean that that's that's a, a natural progression, and probably a natural progression around life anyway. I mean, it, but it's but it's taken a while for the insurance industry to, to, to kind of catch up, um, and and that that can be a bit of a trend in insurance. It takes a while to get there, but when it does get there, then then it tends to mm. literally take off. So, I mean, I would say electronic trading is, is certainly a step up in the last ten years. Um, I think some of the observations I would say about risk and risk appetite and the things people are insuring. So when I started, there was a lot, it wasn't necessarily a marine conversation, but it was a lot of conversations going on in the market about asbestos. So in the 60s, 70s and 80s, a lot of people worked in industries where they had, had exposure to asbestos and it can take decades to manifest those kind of devastating illnesses. Um, and there's been a lot of kind of retroactive claims in, in that space. And equally, I think in the 1990s, there was quite a lot of medical malpractice conversations going on about things like breast implants, you know, um, bursting and leaking and all of those sort of things. So I think now, I think because business is bigger, um, I think the social responsibility, the 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 optics of companies' choices and the industries they support and the consequences of those spaces and where they want to invest are leading different conversations about the risks going forward. So a really good example would be that when I started um, handling things like livestock carriers and whaling ships were very insurable in London and now they're not mm. and that isn't necessarily because the risk has changed I think that's because the environment the understanding the 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 optics of of what people want to be associated with have changed so I do think um, perhaps historically Lloyd's and the city was kind of seen as slightly an uncaring money-making machine but now I think there's um there's a lot to be said for the progress that, that we've seen even in the last five years, yeah. let alone in the last 20. It's, it's a real pace of change. Yeah, I think that, that social, corporate social responsibility, the responsibility that we have to the planet and the people within it as well, especially since COVID and how companies reacted to that became like a marker of, of, of how responsible yeah. they were, yeah. I think is, is a huge one and actually... A, it's more appealing to people to be working in an industry that is seen as responsible or trying to be yeah. more responsible it's, it's huge yeah. um i w wanted to just ask around some of the projects that, that you've worked on specifically within marine logistics mm -hmm. um and one that i think is is um relatively recent is the working with the un mm -hmm. i wondered if you would be able to just give us a bit of background to that project and what it was Okay, so um, the UN are a multinational organisation that have lots and lots of very complex responsibilities, um, one of which uh, was alongside other agencies like Greenpeace and the uh, International um, Maritime Organisation had identified um, quite an elderly ship that had been uh, permanently moored off of the coast of Yemen. And its original purpose was 
there to receive oil that had been produced in Yemen but the infrastructure wasn't good enough for them to build terminals and various other things so the oil would be um, produced in Yemen and delivered to this ship by a pipeline and she's an enormous huge ship she's about three four football pitches long something like that I mean it's it's difficult to kind of visualize the size of her um, and so she'd get full of oil and then little ships would come along and take their you know designated uh, cargo and then they'd go off and sell it and that all worked perfectly well until the uh, civil war broke out in in Yemen um, and production stopped and the ship wasn't looked after very well and she was about one third full of oil and the warring parties decided that the oil on board was the subject of quite a lot of conflict about who owned it, whether it was the, the Houthis or the government. Um, so they put sea mines around it so nobody could get to it. So you've got an elderly ship full of about a million barrels of crude oil in a particularly dangerous area that's just getting older and older and older. And still responds differently in warm water than cold water and unsurprisingly this is warm water um, and the perceived condition of the vessel was that she could collapse at any moment and generate a catastrophic oil spill which in terms of our industry would paralyse global shipping it would probably stop all, all uh, ships going through the Suez and devastate the Red Sea but on a hum, human level on a humanitarian level Yemen is in, in is, is in food crisis and food deprivation and is terribly reliant on incoming aid so if the ocean was full of oil it would stop and interrupt the receipts of food aid so the modeling looks around 14 million people could starve um, and then, of course, there's the ocean environment. You know, we've got coral reefs, we've got a whole ecosystem, which, depending on which report you read, it would take anywhere between 25 and 250 years to recover. So it, it wasn't a question of if, it was a question of when. Mm -hmm. So lots of extremely clever people got involved. How are we going to resolve this? How are we going to do this? Um, months and months of negotiation to try and allow... Uh, the various interested parties to step away and let other people come in uh, to resolve this um, and the project is enormous it's ongoing it's on YouTube as recently as yesterday um, and the idea is to to get the oil off and to put the oil into a much newer ship um, and then to safely remove the elderly ship um, so ships end up being recycled actually so shipping is one of those weird industries that's terribly old but actually is ahead of the curve from that point of view so um, once she's empty and once she's sufficiently clean she'll eventually end up going to a scrap yard being broken down and melted down and recycled and a new one will be born um, but the containment system being the new ship um, is the most critical one because it's mm. a safe environment for that oil to be uh, contained until the resolution of who owns it and how it can be sold and where the funds go um, can be dealt with and it, that, that might take a very short period of time or a very very long period of time so the complexities of this um, have been enormous I'd say it's been a team of us probably working every day for six months to talk about how to put the insurances together and the various contracts and interested parties um, we have had access to some brilliant experts and minds and um, the surveyor that is there all day every day is looking at vessel stability what happens when you take um, liquid out of a very fragile vessel because you've got equilibrium with external forces and internal forces and if you whip out all the oil the whole thing could collapse like a coke can in, uh, in the sky so you know all those calculations have been really important then we've had chemists come along and say well we're going to take a sample of this oil we're going to see how it's degraded and what it might be worth but also we're going to do a DNA fingerprint so if there is an oil spill in a month's time, six months time, and somebody says it's your oil, we've got DNA fingerprint of this crude oil, which is unique to this particular cargo. Um, 
and the labs are, and, and, and the science involved in that is just mind blown. So it's been really interesting, certainly for, you know, for me and a number of my colleagues, you know, we've, we've really enjoyed the learning process mm. of this. It's been really challenging. And, and ultimately, um, it, it really is proving and demonstrating that insurance has facilitated a globally important potential crisis and has supported the resolution of this particular potential problem. Without insurance, one could argue it would never have happened. And I think for everybody involved and everybody has a stake in this, um, it's better to be in front of the problem than responding to it afterwards, proactive rather than reactive. Absolutely. I mean, it's it's it sounds like that would be a catastrophic situation on a global scale on all fronts like you mentioned people environment shipping everything would be hugely affected and i know that it's ongoing so it's kind of not out the out the water not finished yet but i think um i can see that you're you're just like just want to get the oil off and that's the kind of focus and being able to well i think globally you have a choice you do nothing and then wait for something really bad to happen and then you've got to get all the experts together which best 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 case scenario if you get oil spill response people there in three or four days it's already washing up on the shore right it, it's kind of a bit late or you make the choice well let's accept that this is in a critical situation and we're going to get the cavalry there to make sure in every possible way that nothing bad happens but if it did happen everybody's there already it's it's like staging a car crash mm. with, with you know the, with the paramedics there you know they're they're already in, in situ and you know touch wood it's it's all going very well at the moment um, and the extraordinary efforts of you know the salvors and the legal team and the chemists and the surveyors and the underwriters because this has been a very collaborative effort you know this this is uniquely a London market risk this I don't believe this could be placed broked handled understood in the way it has been in london anywhere else in the world we asked people that hadn't committed to it to give up two hours of their life and come to the old library in lloyd's and be presented to about something that's pretty mm. hairy and scary um and and you know leap off the cliff with us uh, with the un with 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 the surveyors um and it's important and they've done it but it's also yeah it's being part of something that is doing the right thing for so many people and it's being on the right side of history in that respect of like this isn't something that we usually traditionally have looked at but why not we're in an industry where we do support so many different things and this is the kind of thing we should be involved in massive, you know massive feel good factor for, for, for everyone. yeah hopefully hopefully Eventually. fingers <laughs> crossed uh, yeah massive but I mean got, your favourite risk ever, that one? <laughs> well, I can remember saying to one years. of the younger writers, it was like, oh my God, he's got you know, sea mines and it's can blow up and it's full of gas and you know, you know, where's Steven Seagal and his vest? And I said, look, this is the maritime equivalent to Live Aid. Yeah. You don't want to be the only band that didn't play. I get that. And, and, and you can really see the pride of people that have supported it. You know, LinkedIn's just gone crazy. We sort of broke the internet with, with a lot of the messaging that's gone on because people want to be associated with doing something for the right reasons. It's, it's good for, the, it's good for yeah. the soul. It's good for business. It's good for the planet. It's good for everybody. But, yeah, I'd say, it, yeah, it's, a, it's definitely a career highlight, you know. Um, you don't get to use Live Aid and you're broke very often, do you? <laughs> no, <laughs> you know, and, and I was waiting for the per- first person saying, you know, you're Bob Geldof <laughs> or something. But, um, you know, you. But, um, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's definitely been a career career highlight. Um, you know, I think, I think, you know, a lot of industries you're supporting um, kind of anonymous yeah. clients and anonymous businesses and, you know, we're really lucky we get the opportunity to travel and... I think in Howden we've got a, we've got a culture where we want to meet the guy who writes the check. You want to stare them in the eyes. You want to understand that they're they're the right people that we want to deal with as much as we're the right people they want to deal with. And it and it is a it is a it's a transactional relationship, but it's more than that. You know, we want to we want to match with the right people. Mm. Um, but something like this, which is so enormous and it and it's got that massive overriding 
feel good factor and you know god forbid anything goes wrong but if it did go wrong it's not because there isn't a single person involved in this that hasn't tried yeah. the best and it will hopefully be setting a precedence as well of of what the insurance industry as a whole specifically howden but the kinds of things that the kinds of lengths people will go to to be supporting risks that just seem untouchable from the outside and actually you know this is the way that the industry should be going we should be involving more specialists and scientists and all sorts of well, people well, the COVID vaccinations was a really good example so one of the carriers in lloyd's um was approached to say we need to get the vaccinations from A to B, they need to be temp temperature controlled and they're extremely fragile and susceptible to, you know, not just temperature, but, you know, volatility because of the, 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 the form of carriage. And they said, right, we can do it for $1. We'll do it, you know, you have, you have to, by law, you have to have some kind of consideration yeah. of the contract to make it open, we'll do it for $1. This is so important, we're doing it. So, you know, you don't always get stuff for free, but every now and again, there's something that's just bigger. And the right thing important. to do. Um, and again, that was, a, that was a London appetite. That was a London response to a global challenge. I think it's really, you know, it's a, it's a fantastic showcase for, for Lloyds in London. Absolutely. It'd be good to know from your perspective, for the industry or specifically maritime, I'm thinking more about tech, but you might correct me on that, the things that are going to impact over the next five to ten years um impact the industry impact risks especially um is technology going to be a part to play in how things change i'm taking this one <laughs> um yeah absolutely i mean it, it's you know it we're we're, we're as, a, as an industry fairly early on i mean i mean insurance is behind a lot of the advancements a lot of the tech a lot of the the imagination the entrepreneurial ship of of of, of things that happen in the world and things that are built or created um, you know, insurance is behind that, but probably didn't keep up with what it's it was kind of do as I do, don't do as I say. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, the, 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 some of the some of the projects we're working on now, and 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 how we'll we'll use technology to 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 almost take rather than the stage where you had to have a Lloyd's ticket belonging to a Lloyd's broker to walk into Lloyd's with a bit of paper and get someone to sign it, is to take that technology out to the clients, and we we spend a lot of one of the happy inconveniences of our life is we spend quite a lot of time traveling the world and, and staying in some very nice places different cultures etc to meet with clients but it's also then taking how do we take what we know as the Lloyd's market to those people well in, in, in days gone by that was that was us so it was us communicating about what we did and, and to Jill's point earlier you know your underwriter's name is this and this is what you do and the clients would come to London we'd all meet but if you could then take some of the technology out to some of those regions you can give them access Mm. to this market through us on and then that's it's got to be the, the right way of doing things i mean no one orders a pizza by phoning up and asking for a pizza anymore no one books a taxi by phoning up and having a chat and and it's not to say that those big risks like the un one that does need a personal touch and should have one you know that, that's a whole different uh, 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 field but there are more simplistic insurances and and by that i mean you know car insurance most of us do that online household insurance travel insurance you know we're we're, we're that's what we do. We're insurance. Mm. It's not a million miles from that. There are there are elements of what we do that could be done more efficiently with 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 with, with tech, um, and and it will do. It's moving a little bit slower than than probably it should. To be honest, um, you know, as, as a company, we've we've pushed ahead with that. But it, I mean, that that's that's going to be a change. That's yeah. going to be a sea change. You know, the, unfortunately, the face to face stuff is going to become a little bit less. I mean, in in Certainly, when I started, you know, the only way you would get an insurance policy completed would be to walk into Lloyd's to do it. Underwriters in Berry wouldn't even meet you outside of Lloyd's. You had to be inside Lloyd's to get an agreement done. That's changed, and that did change. And meetings were done in rooms, or presentations were done. Um, now, because of what's happened with COVID, that changed. And 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 if it wasn't for COVID, we probably wouldn't be as advanced as we no. are now. So it was a a rather happy consequence. Of Catalyst for yeah, yeah, yeah for those, that change. We'd still be. Walking about yeah. with bits of paper under arms. Thinking, thinking about people wanting to come into this industry um, and or not knowing what they want to do, mm -hmm. but are open to the idea of working in this industry, what advice or actually specifically what skills would you be looking for when you're growing a team, when you're thinking about the team you work in specifically, what do you look for? What do you want from someone? Um, what would you advise, advise people to be concentrating on if they wanted to come into the industry? 
I would say that interpersonal skills are the most important thing for, for, for me. Um, I've, I've hired and trained a number of teams over the years and you know I think that you know we, we, we can teach we can teach skills you can learn the systems you can you know understand the risk but I think the ability to have a curious mind to have um, a, a pleasant attitude where you're able to get on with other people um, to take some personal initiative, you know, it's you can make any task as 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 dull or as interesting as you as you like, you know. Um, say the carriage of grain, you might go, well, okay, it's going from A to B and it's grain, so what? But actually, if you've got the right kind of mindset, you can go, well, well you know, where where everything that's going on in Ukraine, that was the breadbasket of Europe. Where, where are we getting it from now? And who's buying it? And what's the grain price volatility um, and that's why when my mum goes to the supermarket she's saying sunflower oil is more expensive than diesel this is the mindset you need where people are going to have the the interest and the motivation to to think broader than the individual task because if you've got a curious mind and, and a nice attitude I think there's a place there's a place and it doesn't necessarily have to be shipping it can be um, as I say music you know there's there's lots of insurance surrounding music sport is another yeah, perfect nice. example yeah. you know the amount of money in sport now and the sponsorship and you know the contracts including morality clauses and all these kind of consequences um, stadium insurance anything that a single which is a single level of interest, there is insurance supporting it. And I think if you've got the mindset where you're interested, yeah. that's great. That's the yeah. great, greatest place to, to start. And in a way, it kind of doesn't matter if you've got a, a degree in history or, or geography. Um, if, if you've got a, a passion, a, a niche passion, or, or a general passion that you're interested in, in kind of exploring, there's probably insurance supporting it. Yeah. No, great. If, you, if, you, if you pick on any interest you've got, chances are there's a connection to insurance somewhere. That whether whether it be sport, whether it be architecture, it could be art, it could be whatever you whatever you would want to sort of travel, mm. whatever you're interested in. There's an element of, of insurance behind that, but obviously that that, that creates an opportunity for, for for a role where we are. I mean, I, I think it, it is about you know there is a hard work element to it, but as we said at the beginning, not many people arrive in insurance knowing all about some aspect of insurance most people arrive not knowing anything you know beyond what they might have bought or their parents might have bought um they're, they're, there's always something to go into there's always the interest element and you know well terrorism insurance what's happening around the world but you know there's this there's so many facets to it that if, you, if you've got an interest in it and you're, and you're willing to to explore those interests you'll find a role here i mean there's the, the, there will be an opportunity to do something like that. That's it. So there aren't specific qualifications you're looking for. You're not, you know, if you're employing someone, any background is that is that kind of valid? Well, there's, 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 uh, there's, no, there's nothing uh, the, flipping that around. There isn't anything I would sit and think, okay, you couldn't do the job. No. I, I, you know, it's not. You know, I, I left school at sixteen, and and you know, there wasn't university wasn't. Invented my head to be honest, but it wasn't part of, of where I was going to be. So, and there's a lot of people like that. Um, and, and yeah, uh, the people have come into this in, in, in any age, you know, whether it now be 18 or, 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 or after after university, or we've got a guy who was, a, who was an ex sportsman who's, who's decided that maybe his career was, wasn't going to go where he wanted it to do and came out and unless we've got two of those and then did insurance. So, you know. The well, next naval officer who did 15 years in the yeah. navy, yeah. and then came into into Lloyd's first, um, who, who supports the next military initiative um, to help some of the digitalisation projects and everything else. And now he's in here, and he's a he's a really interesting, unique uh, colleague because of his experience at sea, and, and in in the military environment, but also because of his touch points on the digital side. So it's a really good bridge. Yeah. Um, no, I don't think anything's off the table. Um, I think a you know, bit of enthusiasm, curious mind, um, passion. Passion is what we need, really. Um, you know, as we said, you know, think of a subject that that's your passion, and there's probably something there's probably can... something here that would support that. That's excellent. I think that's that's all we have time for. But thank you so much.
both of you that's really really helpful to understand a bit more about what you do but also what how other people could get into the industry as well and where it's going um and you've definitely demystified lloyd's no no idea really what the ins and outs of, of how that looked so um thank you very much for your, both of your time really appreciate it thank you, thank you. Thank you.